Who wants to go watch Rocky now? If you've seen the movies, which I'm assuming almost everybody has, um, especially the first one, they are, they are about victory. They're about winning. And one of the things that people really, one of the things that people really loved about the first movie is that even though he didn't ha- win, he was still victorious. Um, and in his, in his own right, he did win. He did, he did what people thought he couldn't do. And <clears throat> as much as I loved Rocky, I think they got a little long. I mean, what are we at? Rocky number 57 or something like that. Um, it's a story that, that we all like to watch. The underdog coming and being victorious. Or even, even the one who's supposed to be victorious fails and then comes back and is victorious again. Um, it, 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 it pulls at our heartstrings because we just like, we like to pe- good people to win. In fact, in the, it, it, many years ago, um, you did not watch TV where the good guy doesn't win in the end. That's what, that's what TV was all about. TV was not like real life. In TV, the good guys always won, and it was always wrapped up in the hour slot that it was given. If you watch TV nowadays, guess what? Episodes have cliffhangers. That they, and they do that because they want you to watch the next one. And I get that. If I'm going to watch TV, I want to watch TV where the good guys win, and it's all wrapped up, and we feel happy about it. If I want to feel bad about a TV show or a movie, if I want to feel bad, period, I just have to experience life. I don't have to watch TV to feel bad about it. The bad guy dying in the movie does not make you feel good. We want that victorious, not just, not just the feeling of, of victory, but actually being victorious. And <clears throat> I think as believers, as people who have committed our <clears throat> people who have committed our lives to Christ, we know that we have victory. But sometimes we fight to live in it. Sometimes it's just a fight to live in victory. But one of the things that I, I know about being victorious is that can, you can only be victorious if you are a contend, contender. So the question I have is, are you a contender? Are you, a, you know the Super Bowl's coming up, right? And um, if you were to read the, the, the news outlets at the beginning of the season, some of the people who are in the final four of, the, uh, of going to the Super Bowl are, were expected to be there. There is one team that was not really expected to be there. Um, and, and, and they were not considered contenders. Are you a contender? A contender is somebody who has the possibility, has the possibility of being victorious. Jude actually talks about that. And so we're going to look at that. At are you a contender? We like to say yes. We want to say yes. But is saying yes the truth? Let's look. We're going to read Jude. We're going to start. We're probably just going to get through the first four verses today. Jude, verse 1. This letter is from Jude, a slave of Jesus Christ and a brother of James. I am writing to all who have been called by God the Father who loves you and keeps you safe in the care of Jesus Christ. May God give you more and more mercy, peace, and love. Dear friends, I have been eagerly planning to write you, to write to you about the salvation we share. But now I find that I must write about something else, urging you to defend the faith that God has entrusted once for all to his holy people. 
I say this because some ungodly people have wormed their way into your churches, saying that God's miraculous grace allows us to live immoral lives. The condemnation of such people was recorded long ago, for they have denied our only Master and Lord Jesus Christ. Um, Jude, as we know, um, if you don't know, I'll tell you, is the brother of James. If you, don't, if you didn't know that after the first verse, um, you need to go back to reading class because it states it there. Uh, James, we know, is the half-brother of Jesus. So guess who Jude is? It's not a trick question. Half-brother of Jesus. Very good. He does not, he does not say, he could have very easily said that, but he doesn't say that. Uh, maybe, be, maybe humility set in a little bit. Um, but he had to identify himself because for people to know who is speaking and to listen to who is speaking, you have to identify yourself. James is actually, even saying he's the brother of James was quite an accomplishment because James was the leader of the church. I know Peter was uh, for a while, but James became the leader of the church in Jerusalem, the most prominent churches in the first century. And so he was kind of saying, hey, you need to listen to me because this is who I am. But I also think he has a relationship with the people that he's talking to. Otherwise, he would not call them. Uh, <clears throat> in, in this verse, he says, dear friends. Actually, that's a, a, a poor translation of the Greek word there. Actually, it, it, a better understanding is beloved. Though, more like those who, I, those who I consider my close friends. And so there's this, there's this relationship that, that they have. And we also know it, by reading this that James had a particular thing that he wanted to write about. And it was the salvation. It was the salvation that they all share. He wanted to encourage them in their salvation. He wanted to, to, to push them in their salvation. To experience all, the, all of that salvation has to offer. But, and this is a big but. But, he doesn't do that because he has to talk about something else. He says, but now I find that I must write about something else, urging you to defend the faith that God has entrusted once for all time to his holy people. What he's saying is, I want to tell you, and I want to encourage you, and I want to ex exhort you to, to this salvation that we all have, but there's a problem. So now I have to talk about defending your faith. There's, there's two things I want to highlight real quick. First is, um, he talks about defending your faith. And if you read the rest of the, the chapter, um, it, 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 you get this idea, uh, and it, it, he even says it here, uh, defending your faith because of some ungodly people who have wormed their way into your churches. First thing we need to understand is he is telling them to defend their faith from people who are inside the church. He's not talking about people outside the church who might be attacking him. He's talking about the virus that is within the church. And as we continue, you'll understand a little bit more of why that is. Because, listen, when people outside the church tell people inside the church things, a lot of times we just dismiss it. And rightly so, because a lot of the things they say is, I mean, you came from monkeys. I, I don't know what to say to that. Uh, it's wrong, I guess. I mean, we dismiss that. But when somebody from inside the church tells us something, we have more of a chance of believing it. Even if, even if we believe it to be false, we will still entertain the idea. And that is a foothold Satan does, is that he uses people inside the church to get a foothold into the thoughts of other believers because of things that have been said. 
I would be would be the the most prominent illustration that I can think of right now is the acceptance of a homosexual lifestyle. At some point in time, it was proposed from people inside the church to other people inside the church that this is an acceptable uh, way of living in front of God. If it was somebody outside the church that was saying this, you don't know what you're talking about. But, let's bring it inside the church. Let's find somebody within the church who's, who says, I'm a Christian, I'm a God follower, and I, this is acceptable before God. And so, he's addressing a specific situation, Jude is. And that is, the people who have wormed the way, and that's the, that's the phrase here, wormed their way into the church, and are starting to cause problems. Not problems physically with dissension or, or, or um, with fighting, but with false doctrine. And in, in one, of the, one of the most prominent, he says, um, they are saying God's miraculous grace, uh, grace allows us to live immoral lives. Listen, there is nowhere in Scripture you find anywhere that says sin is okay, even with God's grace covering it. And yet, that's what they were—that's what they were—that's what they were doing. A proper understanding of sin is that it is horrific before God. It is terrible, and and it is so terrible. It is so bad, and it is so evil that you yourself can do nothing about it. It takes somebody better than you. And I'd say you as in the most, the most sinless person on the face of the earth. Because the sin, most sinless person on the face of the earth, apart from Jesus, still has sin. So he's talking to people inside the church, and he uses, he uses the word, I say that, he, the New Living Translation uses the word defend, and I, I don't, I'm not a big fan of that, that word, um, and I'll, I'll explain why. So I looked uh, about 15, 16, 17 different versions, and um, of those different versions, um, only three of them did not use the word contend. One of them used the word, as you see here in the New Living Translation, um, they used the word defend. One of them used the word fight. And one of them used the word agonize. So New Living Translation used the word defend. I don't necessarily think it's a bad one, but it doesn't give the whole scope of the idea. Um, the YLT... Has anybody ever heard of the YLT? It is the Young's Literal Translation, and he actually uses the word, uh, it actually uses the word agonize. And then there's the BBE. Anybody know what that is? The Bible and Basic English, and they use the word fight. So, interpreting this, this word, many of the interpreters uh, of translations of the Bible like the word contend, and I like the word contend too. Um, if you to look, if you look at the Greek word, it is the only time that this particular Greek word is used in the New Testament. Okay, so if you read um, the Bible and you were to look up the word contend in your Bible, you would see that it might pop up about eight or nine times. And in this passage being one of them. But they're not all the same Greek word. They're just the, the best translation that you can come up with. Um, what I like about contend is that it gives you the real idea that the author meant. It has the idea of an athletic event. Are you a, are you a contender? 
will you, are you going to contend in this athletic event? Listen, uh, <clears throat> the, Olympic, the, 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 the Olympic Games were a big thing. And there was a lot of, Paul does extensive illustrations involving athletic events. And that is the idea here, is are you going to, are you going to push yourself and contend for the faith? Are you going to work hard? Everybody knows that if you want to be the best, you have to work hard at it. If you want to be good, some of you could probably get along with just natural talent. If you want to be better than average, some of you can just lay back and do nothing and you can just be better than average. Some people work really, 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 really hard. I mean, they, they put all of their effort into it, and they're still below average. If you want to, if you want to contend, it's not, about, it's not about where you end up. It's about how hard you push to contend, how hard you push to fight. And we see, this, we see this in Scripture. We don't have a time to go to all of the places, but it is about what you, what you how much energy you, you send out doing any particular thing. Some of us spend a lot of energy at work. Some of us spend a lot of energy at play. Some of us spend a lot of energy... Um, at sitting down and watching TV. Although there's not a lot of energy I think can be spent watching TV, but you spend a lot of time doing it. The question, the question is to be to, to to contend for the faith requires you to make it a priority and you have to do something about it. The question now comes to if we want to be a contender. If we want to contend for the faith, if we want to actually, actually work at being victorious, what is it that we have to do to con contend for the faith? There are three questions I think we can look at that will help us. If you are asking, am I a contender for the faith or not, you have to ask yourself these questions. And the very first one is, who are you fighting for? Now, this seems pretty obvious, right? I'm fighting for Jesus, right? I, I mean, I don't think if I, if I asked everybody here, I'm pretty sure 95% of you would say, if I say who you're fighting for, it would say, either you would either say Jesus or God, or maybe you might say the Bible. But are we really fighting for Jesus? Are we really fighting for Jesus? I say that because I know a lot of people who are not necessarily fighting for Jesus. They're fighting for their own set of personal convictions. If people spent as much an effort, time, as truly fighting for God as they fought for their own personal convictions, this world would be a whole different place. So let's talk about what convictions are first. Convictions are a set of beliefs that you adhere to, that you believe as truth. Okay? That you believe as truth. Those are, those are convictions. And, and we all have them. And everybody's convictions are different. I don't, care, I don't care how much time you spend with somebody. Your convictions could grow together, but you will always have differing convictions because God made us all different. The question you have to ask yourself, am I fighting truly for Jesus or am I fighting for a set of convictions that I hold? Here's a couple of questions that you can ask yourself to try and find out. One is, do I expect other people to live the way I live? If that is your answer, you are fighting for conviction and not for, for Christ. Because how you live is based on what? Your understanding of what the scripture says.
There's a danger in, 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 in conviction, but there's also a blessing that comes along with conviction. Conviction will bring us together as no other thing. As God's people, it will bring us together, but can also tear us apart. Once your conviction is imposed on other people, it starts tearing people apart. Convictions can draw us closer to God, but can also pull us away. Once your convictions become a way to earn God's favor, it starts pulling you away from God. Conviction must be a rock we stand on, or we will be washed away. Now, we have these convictions, and, and we have these convictions based on our understanding of what Scripture says. And if we do not stand and stay on that rock of conviction that we have in God's Word and what Jesus has done for us, we were washed away, just like the sand on the seashore. And, it, and ultimately, convictions are like opinions. We all have them, and we all believe ours is correct. As a, <clears throat> as a pastor <clears throat> within the Assemblies of God, uh, the Assemblies of God has put together a set of convictions that they expect all pastors to live by. Um, and one of, those, one of those convictions has to do with drinking alcohol. Um, and they don't have to worry about me. I've shared this multiple times. I don't like the taste of alcohol, and so I am not going to drink it. I am not going to spend $8 on a glass of wine that I don't like. And if they make it taste the way I would like it, I'll just drink the orange juice instead and save myself five bucks. I choose, I choose to, to live under their conviction because of a mutually agreed upon desire. Uh, they want me to be a part of their fellowship. I want to be a part of their fellowship. So we agree upon this. Um, but at what point does my conviction, what point is it okay for my conviction to be passed on to you? And, and, and this is just not me. This is everybody. Everybody has to ask this question. At what point is our conviction about something okay to be passed on to somebody else? Well, it's okay to pass your convictions on to everybody you meet. What you cannot do, what you cannot do is demand they adhere to your convictions. I'll give a, I'll give a, a I met a man a while back. Um, he was a missionary, and uh, this was, man, this was like in the late 90s, I think. He was a missionary, um, and he was actually in a missionary to, uh, to people st stuck in the porn business. That's what, he, that's what he did. He raised money, and he would go, and he would minister to people within the porn business. Um, as you could probably guess, there were times where he was exposed to uh, nudity, and that would probably be the, 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 e the, the, the easiest and, and most simple thing to say right there, okay? Um, <clears throat> now, Nudity in and of itself is, is, just don't, just stay away from it. Not just because God says stay away from it, but because it leads to a bunch of, whole bunch of other stuff. But his conviction about being a minister or, or, or a missionary to, to that type of arena is not the same, it's not the same conviction that we all share. I'm going to be honest with you, I don't even want to go to that arena, much less be a missionary to that arena. 
but it's a conviction he has. What if he decided that all of you should live under his conviction? Convictions are dangerous when we expect, when we do not keep our convictions or when we demand our convictions to be held outside of ourselves. There are certain things in the Bible that are, <clears throat> that are unquestionable. The Ten Commandments. God actually used his own writing to write the Ten Commandments on the stone tablets. Um, those are non-negotiables. Um, the other uh, commandments in the Old Testament were all commandments to tell you how to keep the Ten Commandments. Every one of them. So, should we go watch a movie? When I was growing up, um, movies weren't, were just beginning to be uh, acceptable. As you could go to a movie, it would be, it's okay. You won't lose your salvation if you go to a movie. You're not gonna, you're not gonna lose your salvation um, if, if, if you go, if you play cards, if you go to the bowling alley, because your salvation is dependent on those things. But I know people who have told me that I should not go watch a rated R movie. So I asked them, why? Well, because God doesn't want you to do it. Why? Because it's evil. Why? You understand what I, what I was trying to do? I was trying to get this person to explain to me um, why he held that conviction. Now, there's a reason why rated R movies are rated R. Okay? And just because something isn't good for you doesn't mean that it, it, that it's going to cause you to lose your salvation. Just because, hey, listen, <clears throat> I've said it, I shared this all the time. I would eat a whole bag of M&M's. I would be eating right now a bag of M&M's while I'm preaching, if I could get away with it. But is eating all of that bag of M&M's good for me? Absolutely not. And it's not just healthy. It's not just a health issue. Those of you who think that me eating a whole bag of M&M's is, is solely a health issue, are, you're missing the point. It's about control. It's about controlling yourself. I know I shouldn't do it. I do it anyway. Why? Because I can't control myself. The reason, the reason convictions are so dangerous is because now we are telling other people how God expects them to live. Now, there is, there, there is <clears throat> when we see somebody doing something dangerous, whether it's physical or spiritual, when we see somebody doing something dangerous, we have an obligation. And, and, and sometimes we use our convictions, in fact, most of the time we use our convictions to share with that person. And there is some things that we can do. I'm not saying that if you see somebody doing something that is, that is dangerous, <clears throat> doing something that is dangerous spiritually, actively involved in sin, or, what, or things that I see that could be dangerous, I'm going to go to that person. Listen, I have, I have a belief that a man and a woman should not live in the same house before they get married. I don't remember reading that anywhere in the Bible. 
It was not an issue in Bible times. Um, but, so why in the world would I want to share with them the inherent dangers of doing that if it's not a sin? Because it could lead to sin. And so there's a reason why we would share our, some of our convictions with other people. But to tell them this is how you have to live means you are now becoming God's voice to them about life. In a couple of weeks, a couple of weeks, it's probably after Easter now, now that I think about it, after Easter, I'm going to be talking about, I'm going to be doing a series called um, 10 Words to Live By. And if you sat through my Wednesday night study on the Ten Commandments, you're going to know that's what it is. I'm going to do a series on Ten Commandments. And one of the commandments says, don't use God's name in vain. And we, um, uh, that, the, the word vain there, uh, <clears throat> I don't like that word. It's not because it's not accurate, it's just not complete. It's not just using God's name as a curse word which is what most people believe it to be. It is the misuse of God's name. And one of the biggest misuses I see within the church, this is not outside, this is within the church, is when somebody goes to somebody else and says, God told me to tell you this. But God really didn't tell them to tell you that. They felt conv a conviction about something, and they felt they needed to share that conviction with you. That is 100% inspired by Satan. How do I know that? Because you now are telling somebody that God said something when God didn't tell you to say it. Listen, take, take, misusing God's name, unfortunately, using it as a curse word aside, unfortunately, it is mis God's name is misused more inside the church than it ever was outside the church. With people saying, oh, God told me I need to tell you this. Here's one thing that I've noticed about conviction, and that is this. You have a set of convictions, and you live by those convictions. And, and if, you've, if you've been Christian long enough, it, it, it is pretty, pretty much, the, your convictions are set in stone. And here's what I've noticed. Anybody who is, who's, whose convictions are stronger than yours, you tend to believe they're too legalistic. And anybody whose convictions are, are more liberal than you, yours, well, they might not really be a Christian at all. And why, what do you, where do you make all those bases at? On your convictions. And, and that is the danger. That is the danger of convictions. Is that, is that we have to realize that God's convictions for us are for us. God's convictions for me are for me. I have to relearn that with my wife frequently. Just because God convicted me of something doesn't mean he's convicted her of something. And I cannot expect her to live up to my convictions. If I did, our house would be a miserable place all the time. So... Real quick, how do, we, how, do we, how do we go to somebody that we see they're doing something that is dangerous? How do we go to them without, expect, without expect, pushing our convictions on them? How do we do that? How do we go to them? Because we need to. I think the first thing we need to do is ask ourselves this question. Have we truly heard from the Holy Spirit about going to this person and saying something? 
Okay, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna, we're gonna, we're gonna assume that you understand when, when you are to confront somebody, you would go to that person. Okay. Don't go to their parents. Don't go to their best friend. Don't go to your best friend. Don't go to your parents. Go to that person. Make sure you've heard from the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit not only will tell you what you need to say so that they will receive it, but the Holy Spirit will also start working on, on their hearts to be open to what you have to say. Because I don't care what you say. I don't care how good of a speaker you are. If the person that you're speaking to is not open to what you're saying, they hear nothing. This is the need for the Holy Spirit to move. Next question that we need to ask ourselves if we're going to go to somebody is, have you prayed about it? Have you prayed about it? Some of you need to write this next statement down so you memorize it. In fact, I think it would probably be good for all of you to memorize this statement. If you haven't prayed about it, don't talk about it. If you haven't prayed about it, don't talk about it. Because what, what might very well happen is you'll say something, and, and it very well might be using God's name incorrectly. Make sure that you have prayed about it before you go to them. The last question that, that we need to ask is, are you going to them in love? Are you going to them in love? Or... Are you going to them because you want to align them with your convictions? Unfortunately, too many times we want to align other people to our convictions, and that's not, that's not going to people in love. So what, what are you fighting for? What are you contending for? Are you really contending for, for Jesus or is it some set of convictions that you have put upon yourself? The next question that we need to ask ourselves, if we really want to be a contender, if we really want to be fighting for, for true victory, is who are we fighting against? You know who we're fighting for. Who are we fighting against? Ephesians 6, 10, uh, 10 through 12 says this. A final word, be strong in the Lord and his mighty power. Put on the... All of God's armor so that you'll be able to stand firm against all strategies of the devil. For we are not fighting against flesh and blood enemies, but against all evil and authority of the unseen world, against mighty powers in this dark world, and against evil spirits in the heavenly places. In other words, this is a spiritual battle we're in. We need to understand that. I, I, I do not have a problem with social media posts about godly things. But if it's not backed up with prayer, keep it to yourself. Because it's not going to do any good. We are in a spiritual battle, and the only way we can win is by using spiritual weapons. another thing we're fighting against we're going to get back to that spiritual weapon thing in a minute but there's another thing we're fighting against and, and we read about it in James chapter 1 verses 14 and 15 temptation comes from our own desires which entice us and drag us away these desires give birth to sinful action and when sin is allowed to grow it gives birth to death not only are we fighting this spiritual battle, the evil in the spiritual realm, we are also fighting our sinful nature, our flesh. That old, the devil made me do it, let's be real. Most of the time, <clears throat> you made yourself do it. Sure, he might have enticed you to do it. He might have put the thought, he might have put something in front of you to make you think about it. 
But the devil can't make you do anything you don't want to do, save unless he possesses you. Everything else, that's all you, babe. That's all you. So I, I found this, a pastor uh, wrote something, and, and I want to read it to you. It's, it, I really liked it. So hopefully you get something out of it like I did. We are to be in the world, but one of the strategies for success in defeating the flesh is to put our flesh to work for God. Romans 6.13 says, Do not offer the parts of your body to sin as instruments of wickedness, but rather offer yourself to God as those who have been bought from the, brought from death to life, and offer the parts of your body to, to him as instruments of righteousness. You see, God's strategy is not stop sinning and do nothing. God knows a bored mind is a devil's workshop. God's strategy, then, is for you to serve him. And he goes on by saying, it's hard to sin when you are studying, preparing for a Sunday school lesson. It's hard to sin when you are out witnessing to your neighbor. It's hard to sin when you're at church on Wednesdays. It's hard to sin when you're volunteering to help with the neighborhood kids. It's hard to sin when you're pulling the weeds in front of the church. It's hard to sin when you're actively engaged in ministry. It's hard to sin at a Celebrate Recovery meeting. It's hard to sin when you're busy being a parent to your kids. I've said this, I say this frequently, and it's so true, and it bears repeating time and time again. There are more do's in the Bible than there are don'ts. And if you spend your time doing your do's, you won't have time to do's or don'ts. And if you could, you wouldn't, so you can't say you don't, so it's cruel. Just do. Sure, you're going to, sure. Chances of you falling into temptation and sinning happens. But if we just say, oh, God, please forgive me uh, 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 and, and, and truly repent and not want to do it anymore, but then don't engage in something that is godly, an idle man, an idle hand do the devil's bidding. So we have, so we have this spiritual fight that we fight, and that is outside. And we have this inward fight that we fight, and it, it's a struggle. So the question that, that the final question I, w I want is, how are we fighting? We know who we're fighting for, and we just saw who we're fighting against. Now the question is how we are fighting. Well, to, to, to make sure we're fighting correctly, we need to remember we're fighting the unseen. We're fighting a spiritual battle. So weapons that we need to have, aren't good, physical weapons aren't going to do, you can carry a sword around with you all you want. It's not going to help you win a spiritual fight. You can carry your... your AK-47, still, anyway, for now. Um, but it, what good is that going to do you in a spiritual battle? Paul says that we have other, other weapons. And I want to bring to your attention six. Faith, righteousness, peace, truth salvation, and God's word. You know where those are from? Yes. Those are the armor of God, the belt of truth, the breastplate of righteousness, the sandals of peace, the shield of faith, the helmet of salvation, and the sword of the spirit. These things put in practice in our life will give us victory. We, we work at these things. We work at knowing the truth. We work at living righteously. We work at, at having and dispensing peace. God's word. And it's not just 
God's word is not just the Bible, okay? The Bible is God's word, undisputed, without doubt, God's word. But you know what personal convictions are? They are also God's word to you. That's what personal convictions are. When you have a conviction, when the Holy Spirit places a conviction on your life, that is God speaking to you. And that is why it's so important that we don't expect God, or other people to live according to what God has said to us. God does not expect to everybody to live according to your convictions. The same way he doesn't expect you to live to everybody else's convictions. For everybody who wants other people to live according to your convictions, how would you like to live according to the convictions of the Amish? Anybody want to do that? I know, you, I know some of you are going to, despite, raise your hand, but let's be honest, you like your Netflix too much. You don't want to have, you, you like putting gas in your car and not feeding the horse. I'm going to close with one question. Ask yourself this last question. Are you a contender or are you a pretender? Are you putting on a show or are you willing to fight for a victory? I'm going to close in prayer. As I said, pray. I want you to uh, <clears throat> let God speak to you. Maybe you need to ask for forgiveness because you've been, you've been pushing your convictions on other people. Maybe, maybe you need to, maybe you need to go somebody and share with them something God has put on your heart doing it in the right way. Or maybe you need to go and apologize for something you said. Maybe you need to ask God, help, God, help me. Help me establish a set of convictions in my life. Help me dig into your word and find out what your word says and how I can live by it. Because I'm going to be honest with you. If you make up your own convictions without consulting God's word, they'll do you no good. Because then they just become rules that you have to live by. So I ask God to help you. And I want to leave you with one thought. <clears throat> at the beginning of this, at this, the very beginning of this message, we watched a video, you watched that intro video and what was the name of that song? Come on. Eye of the Tiger. By Survivor. Yes. Eye of the Tiger. Let me propose, if you really want to, if you really want to be the, the person God has you, instead of having an eye of the tiger, maybe you need to have your eye on the lamb. Heavenly Father, we love you and we thank you. We just ask that you would speak to us. Lord, you would move on us through the power of your Holy Spirit. Change us if need be. Align our convictions and what you have for us. And help us to realize that they are for us. Sometimes they need to be shared. Sometimes not. But God, I ask right now that you would just let your spirit move in, in each of our lives. Help us to seek you daily, to look into your word, to find out what the Holy Spirit has for us each and every day. Refresh us, Lord. We thank you. We love you. In Jesus' name, amen. Uh, <clears throat>
So those of you with parents, who are parents, um, of kids that you're trying to raise, I want to, I want to give you this, this bit of advice, okay? <clears throat> Until they are adults, for the most part, your convictions are their convictions. Sometimes if you let young people determine their own convictions, they're probably, they, they, they don't always hear from God necessarily the way they should. I only know that because I was one of those kids who I thought I had it all figured out in convictions, and I was all wrong. So just a little bit of advice. Take it if you need it. Dismiss it if you don't. I love you guys. Be blessed. We'll see you on Wednesday.